Welcome to the Holy Post. Last week, the United States experienced another horrific school shooting. Today, we ask, why is the U.S. incapable of passing sensible gun laws like other countries? And why do so many evangelicals seem to support America's gun culture and the Second Amendment with a religious-like devotion? Then I talked to my friend Andy Crouch about his new book on the dehumanizing effects of technology and what we can learn from the early church about restoring dignity and personhood to our culture. All of that... Plus, we have some listener feedback that's critical of our episode on Roe v. Wade. And just a heads up that we deal with some pretty sensitive topics in this episode, like child mortality and suicide. So if those are difficult topics for you right now, I'd encourage you to skip ahead to the interview, and then maybe come back and listen to the new segment later. Here is episode 511. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Hi, Christian. Hey, how are you? You got that wall completed. Nice job. Yeah. The wall is all filled in. I'm still working on lighting. I, I don't like the lighting yet, so I have to want to make it more interesting. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, everyone. You're a glow. You're a glow from the yeah, great out of window shade open and yeah. the sun is kind of coming. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's You all look right. sunny. You look sunny and happy. And Christian mm -hmm. is not coming from her orange box. She's coming from a location somewhere near Atlanta. Yes, I am. Film festival or child military something or other? <laughs> no, we, um, you know, we're partnered with Delta and Delta and Michelin and Best Defense Foundation are chartering a flight um, to take 30 World War II veterans back to Normandy for D-Day. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. we have a big World War II dinner on the 31st for Memorial Day and to kick that off. And so uh -huh. I'm here for that. Okay. Nice. That sounds delightful. And uh, here's the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Okay, there's been... A uh, fair amount of bad news over the last few weeks, and it just seems to be getting worse. I'm not going to do anything silly today because I don't really feel very silly. But the first thing I wanted to do was go back to our episode on uh, Roe v. Wade and abortion because we, we, we did that episode and then like two days later we had to record the next episode and not many people had time to even listen to the, the abortion episode and respond to it. I read one letter we got very early on that was very, very positive. We also got some less positive feedback. So I thought I would read some of that, some of the critical feedback so that no one could say, oh, you just cherry pick the people that like what you said and you only tell us about them. So we also got some negative feedback from that episode. And I wanted to run through some of the comments. Um, Here's uh, a letter we got from Christine. Whenever the topic of abortion is on your show, I immediately start to construct walls around my heart. I've been offered an abortion um, as a very valid option after my youngest son received a rare, life-limiting, life-threatening diagnosis at his midterm anatomy scan. He eventually died when he was just four days old after an extremely stressful, high risk and costly pregnancy due to complications related to his diagnosis. After we received his diagnosis, we started to pursue, pursue additional testing to determine if he would be eligible for prenatal intervention to give him a good shot at a quality life. The life was going to include a couple of surgeries before birth, a four and a half month NICU stay in a hospital two hours from my other two young sons, dialysis for two years, and a few kidney transplants during his lifetime. We received his diagnosis at around 19 weeks. I was going to have to quit my job to care for a medically complex kid. Anyway, it took about two and a half weeks to gather more information about his specific case uh, that included plane travel to a specialist hospital, uh, fetal MRIs and echocardiograms. At that point, we had all the information we would need to determine how to proceed. In my state, termination for medical reasons is allowed up to 24 weeks. 
Had we received his diagnosis closer to 21 weeks when our original scan was planned, we would not have had the time to do our due diligence and gather more information about his case before coming up on that cutoff date. Had we decided that an abortion was the least worst decision, the most loving and merciful option for our beloved son, we would not have been given the option. We would have had to prepare to watch our son be born and die as he suffocated in our arms without comfort care provisions generally afforded to those receiving end-of-life care. It seems like we have a tendency to get outraged over these monsters who have had a late-term abortion without considering who has been placed in the horrible position to even have one. Second and third trimester abortions are generally only offered to women like me who are blindsided with these horrible diagnoses for their very wanted and very loved children. These are not easy or flippant decisions. Mothers nine months pregnant don't just wake up one day and say, nope, I'm done. When discussing common sense regulations, I would argue that we need to expand protections. This is unbelievably complex, and it terrifies me that we would leave it up to states and those in legislation to determine what is right and moral when they couldn't possibly understand the many unique positions we as individuals might find ourselves in. These decisions should be reserved uh, to the individual whose body it is with information and support from their medical provider. Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate hearing uh, your story and your feedback. <sighs> Any comments on that one? It's a heart- That's heartbreaking just story. so, so heartbreaking. And I'm so thankful that she took the time to write all of that out because I think when we hear stories like that, it, it does bring the nuance into the conversation and we begin to understand complexities. It's not just a talking point or, you know, some sort right. of political football. It actually is a real person's life that, um, and we have a window into now. And so I really appreciate you sharing that, Christine, and I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sky, did you have- I was uh, echo what Christian just said. It is heartbreaking. And she's absolutely correct that the majority of women who find themselves in a position of having to contemplate a a late-term abortion are doing so out of duress, not out of uh, just a decision or convenience by any means. Uh, my son, who just is in a, finishing his junior year of high school, was born at about 26 weeks of gestation and spent months in the NICU and was very touch and go whether he would survive. Obviously, he did. And it was a, quite a roller coaster emotionally and, and physically and everything else. We also saw other families and kids who did not have a positive outcome, and they are heartbreaking and painful moments. And this is a case where our politics fails us, but the law doesn't have to, because it is entirely possible to create merciful laws that allow for late-term termination of pregnancy when it's medically deemed necessary because of a situation situation like she encountered or- It's it's uh, entirely possible, but it requires nuance on the part of our- legislators. Yes. And that's why I say our politics are failing us and, because and the law yeah. is capable of, of making this work without saying an abortion at eight months for any reason whatsoever is justifiable. And so right. we just haven't approached this entire topic with the nuance, sensitivity, intelligence that it yep. requires. And that's just, that's sad to me because it's people like this who find themselves being tossed around as political footballs and it's not right. Right. Uh, Anonymous commenter said, several commenters already expanded on what I was feeling about this one. If the church was truly interested in creating a culture of life, they would have done so already. Thinking that will magically start happening if Roe is overturned is almost laughable, but it's not amusing in the slightest. And you may roll your eyes at the left overreacting, but many states are already proving them correct. States are considering a limit to contraception, making Plan B a felony. Louisiana even advanced a bill giving a fetus full rights at fertilization, uh, not just conception. And I, I... I'm blind as to what the distinction is, but I'm sure there's a distinction there, which would make abortion and and in some cases miscarriage homicide and do who knows what to IV in vitro fertilization. And that's just a short list. It sounds like all three of you view this as an issue of abortion being wrong based on your religious belief. But the issue at hand is a woman's right to choose what happens to her body, regardless of your religious belief. The government should not be in charge of that. Okay, thank you. 
Point taken. I, d I don't believe my view is based on religious belief, but I understand that that's your uh, perspective. Terry wrote in and said, as an ex-evangelical, now an Episcopalian, this podcast disappointed me. One of the main reasons for me leaving the evangelical church and finding a home in the Episcopal church is this very issue. As a 30-year career, uh, as a 30-year career now retired in my state health and social service department, primarily working with the Medicaid program and then behavioral health, health, much of what was said disappointed me. As a person of faith who believes in the call to serve the poorest of the poor, I had to work for years to try to make ever-dwindling public programs continue to work as they faced cut after cut. In my state, the biggest voices to cut programs that primarily benefited poor women and children were the biggest evangelical churches. However, when programs program cuts happened, the most uh, these same churches could do was a yearly food and clothing drive. Uh, Caitlin is sweet, but to believe there will be a time when we see evangelical churches fight for things like paid family leave and other programs that can help poor women and children, my skepticism runs high. It will not happen. Years ago, I read the book Women, women and Children Last by Ruth Seidel, and it so plainly explained what I was experiencing um, as a health service employee and the slow march to cut programs for the poor. Conservative politics and white evangelical Christians have continued um, to assault much needed social programs since the Reagan area, and they will not stop now and switch course. Another disappointment was when I heard Phil throw out an anecdotal story about the woman riding on the bus to a pro-choice march and the lady beside her states she's had six abortions and that that was her birth control. Again, in my 30 years of working in government programs for the poor, it is these types of stories presented as fact that most House and Senate members love to hear and run with. Uh, and then she mentions Ronald Reagan's famous welfare queen driving a Cadillac story. Um, finally, I also have to point out that Sky's analogy of evangelical churches now lobbying for reform in drug sentencing and getting more involved in seeing treatment as an option is very faulty. And there is a racist element here as well. White evangelical churches did not start down this path until the opioid epidemic hit primarily white, middle, and upper class youth. Suddenly, White evangelicals saw their sons, daughters, siblings, etc., being caught up in the drug world, facing jail time, and in most cases, limited treatment options. In my state in particular, we saw huge shifts in funding move to opioid treatment and stripped funds for alcohol treatment. Meanwhile, in our rural areas, which are primarily indigenous, the main problems remain with alcohol and meth abuse. I sat through many meetings with our tribal health leaders as they lamented that all the new grants coming out were tied to opioid treatment and did not help them at all. So in my state, uh, where the black, brown, and indigenous populations suffer with limited options for alcohol and meth treatment, primarily white opioid users have many options. I do enjoy most of your podcasts, but this one, not so much. Okay. Thank you, Terry Ann. Uh, that's a very valid point of view on all of those points. It is absolutely, and uh, I forget who was that. All one person's comment, or yes. those were different people? No, that was one person there. Okay, uh, th there's a a very valid criticism where I would push back slightly is this idea that white evangelicalism has always operated this way and always will. I think they're correct that in the current era of politics, that everything is accurately reported. But here's the thing. You go back 150 years and it was white evangelicals who were the ones pursuing social reform on things like slavery and child labor and prisons and healthcare. And you go look at evangelicalism in other parts of the world. In England, evangelicals are more known for being socially liberal in their mandates and social justice and healthcare reform. And that's true in other parts of the world. There is something unique about the late 20th century, early 21st century white evangelical movement in America, that is the anomaly here. And so my hope, and I think speaking for Caitlin, who's not here to defend herself, is that the American evangelical movement would return both to its historical position on these issues and look more like its global brothers and sisters on these issues. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's completely far-fetched to believe that the American evangelical church would change and align more with the kinds of policies that they're talking about, because where we have been up to this point in our lifetimes is really weird and incongruous with much of the New Testament and incongruous with much of the church and church history. Okay. So that's okay. where I would 
change perspective a little bit. Well, hold that thought because that topic is going to come into play on our next conversation after I read all these. So hold that that thought. Okay. Uh, And finally, one last one from Carol. Who wrote in to say, as a woman in Texas, the overturning of Roe means the state decides my health care uh, needs. Currently, with the six weeks ban, there are no exceptions for rape or incest, viability of the fetus, and only if my life is in danger, but that is only if I'm in an active emergency state and mere moments from death. In those cases, my doctor would still have to wait to get permission while I'm hemorrhaging. The law also interferes with the treatment of miscarriages as the medicine and procedures are considered abortions. If a fetus is not viable as is uh, or, or, or will not survive the pregnancy or will die at birth, I'm still forced to carry out that pregnancy to term as there is no exception for this. Some fetuses develop without brains or with such severe internal organs that they cannot survive. And to top it all off, Texas has a law that prevents pregnant women from being taken off life support regardless of and any legal adv- uh any legal advance directive they have or what the family wants for them. Texas will keep women on life support as human incubators. And this is not an exaggeration. It happened in Fort Worth in 2014, she says. Texas has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the country, some of the worst social support for women and children, and our foster care system has been under a federal lawsuit for its disastrous treatment of children. It has never worked to support women or babies after birth and is not equipped to do it now. Why would we believe that the state is willing to change now? Much skepticism about actually caring about women is coming out yes toward us yes um i think there's also skepticism legitimate skepticism on the other end of the spectrum which is to say uh those who would argue that a fetus an embryo is a person and therefore is afforded the legal rights of personhood all the way from the moment of conception don't typically hold a consistent application of that. So for example, there was a story that came out, I think in the last week or two, where there is a fairly fringe Christian group that is pushing really aggressively to pass laws, arguing that any woman who has an abortion or any abortion provider should be charged with homicide. And there's a lot of pro pro life voices in the evangelical world who are pushing against that group saying, no, 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 you're going too far. And yet, that's the morally consistent position to hold. If you actually believe that a, a, a six-week-old embryo is a person and afforded all the dignity and rights of a person and is created in the image of God, then the termination of that pregnancy is homicide. But I don't know too many people who actually believe that that's what we should do. So even in our practice, we even as pro-life Christians don't treat fertilized human embryos the same way we do a child at halfway through gestation or eight months or nine months or certainly outside the womb. We make moral differentiations on this all the time. And so for, and then we don't take a consistent moral stance on the pro-life side because the homicide argument makes sense if you believe this is a, a, a person. So anyway, I just, I think there's so many complications and ambiguities here and I'm not prescribing the solution. I'm just saying most of our political conversation doesn't get close to addressing it. And that troubles me. Um, I was just going to ask you to respond to the, you know, some of the pushback before about how, you know, our laws should not legislate, you know, morality for the masses. Um, um, yeah, I don't know that that was was a little bit of a little bit of the pushback, but we've talked about that before. I I think that all of our laws legislate morality in in some form or other. Virtually all of them, you know. It's mm-hmm. we believe it's wrong for people to die unjustly in car accidents, so we have seatbelt laws so that you're right. you know less likely or drunk driving laws. I mean, there aren't that many laws that don't have a moral component to them. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I was listening to a long, a long interview with an abortion ethicist who's pro-choice being interviewed by someone else who's pro-choice. And, you know, she described the pro-life view very accurately and reasonably, you know, and said it really, it, you can't just say my body, my choice. If the issue at hand is, is this another person? Is there mm-hmm. another person involved? If there's another person involved, 
um, then that argument just flies out the window, my body, my choice. So the real question is, what is a person? You know, and that's that we are not going to dive into right now because it's not the topic for today. But most Americans are generally comfortable with an abortion at six weeks and generally uncomfortable with an abortion at 20 weeks. So most Americans feel that something happens in the development process that adds more and more moral wrong um, to, you know, stopping the development of an embryo at, at different stages. And, you know, I understand the desire to, to, you know, to take, to go against it on principle and say, it's just the same. It's just the same. Killing my two-year-old is just the same as preventing the implantation of, you know, a, a, a zygote the size of a poppy seed. It's just exactly the same. You really have to talk yourself out onto an ideological ledge. And even then, I don't think yeah. you really believe it's just the same. If, it, if you had to I, choose don't. one or the other, I don't it's, think exactly. you believe it's just the same. And that was my point in arguing that we're not calling for these, for homicide convictions of women who've ended a pregnancy at six weeks. And we're right. not. Hey, here's something not to do if you're pro-life, if you're a pro-life politician. You know, vote that you're pro-life, say that you're pro-life, and then vote against funding for baby formula for babies. Um, there was a $28 million bill passed called Baby Formula Shortage Bill to help bring in baby formula from other countries because we have a crisis of baby formula. It, it was passed 231 to 192. All 192 votes against were Republicans, the same folks that are the pro-life ones. So the right, Demo I, want, I have not read this story. I have not seen this story, but I... Yeah, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and believe there's more to the story than you've told us that there's something embedded in this bill that was terrible that they couldn't support. And some was there anything more to it than they just I don't, don't want know. somebody research it. Tell us if there was more to it than that. Tell us that it isn't that bad. There was a second bill, just the access to baby formula bill passed the House 413 to nine. All nine of those opposed were also pro-life Republicans. So I don't know, maybe there's something more to it. And, and if you know what, if there's a valid reason why we don't want to fund baby formula, but we want to unfund, um, you know, abortion, uh, let me know. Let me know because I don't get it. And now we're going to go on to more bad news, from bad news to bad news. We recorded uh, this week's, last week's podcast on Monday um, the, the day before, right? Tuesday was the shooting in Texas. Tuesday afternoon, mm -hmm. and then all yeah, that we stuff. seem to we seem to miss these big yeah. milestones by just yeah. a day or so. Right. So we didn't talk about it last week. So we have to talk about it this week. Um, Nineteen kids were shot in a Texas elementary school, and two or three adults or were killed. Oh, that's how many were killed. Worst. Uh, shooting at an elementary school since Sandy Hook. And of course, everybody is pontificating. You know, it's now the moment for pontification. And well, what do we do? What do we do? And immediately you hear people saying, don't politicize, do not politicize this tragedy by talking about gun control. That's what you're doing. You're politicizing this. Um, which led our friend Caitlin to tweet what I thought was a pretty um, insightful tweet. She said, political is not a dirty word. It describes the work that is required to form a common life together, one in which people, especially the vulnerable, flourish. So it is entirely natural and reasonable to respond to great evil by seeking solutions to our shared problems. So she did something mean there. She said, politics isn't that thing that you hate in Washington, D.C., it's actually all of us working together to try to solve shared problems. Ooh, right. dirty trick, Caitlin Shess. Dirty <laughs> trick. Yeah, don't don't well bring said, out Caitlin. don't bring out real definitions in a moment like this. That's <laughs> not fair. Um, the governor of Texas immediately pointed to Chicago. Yeah. Hey, always Chicago. this always happens. 
and said, gun control doesn't work anyway, so don't even bring it up. If you want proof, just look at Chicago. Why yeah. is that a bad argument, Sky? Oh, Why is that it a bad argument? Nuts. He, okay, obviously everybody knows that Chicago has a significant crime problem and a lot of guns involved in a lot of those crimes. Where do most of the guns used in crimes in Chicago come from? Outside Heaven? of Chicago in the suburbs. No. Santa? Indiana. Not actually from the suburbs, believe it or not. The majority the come the majority come from Indiana. <laughs> Chicago Because you can get to Indiana from Chicago in about 10 minutes. Right, because it borders Indiana and Indiana has much looser gun regulations. The second largest source of guns in crimes in Chicago come from Wisconsin. Mississippi. What? I know. Isn't that crazy? Because Mississippi, Mississippi has some of the loosest gun laws in the country where pe- criminals buy them and then bring them into big cities like Chicago, Atlanta, New York. So, so are you saying that gun control laws are less effective when they're only for one city? Or one state, yes. Because mm-hmm. we have open borders in this country where we can travel across state lines. No one is checking your trunk to see if you bought guns in Mississippi. My argument there is if all the states around you have loose gun regulations, it doesn't matter if Illinois has strict gun laws because you can get the guns all around. It's You can't have state by state or city by city gun policies and expect that to work. It has to be right. a national policy. And that's what a lot of these conservative pro-gun politicians like the governor of Texas, they know this. They're not stupid people. They know this, but they make that argument in bad faith because it's a talking yeah. point that they can get away with. We have some additional bad faith arguments coming from senators immediately after the shooting. Senator Ron Johnson says, uh, when asked about stiffer background checks on gun purchases during an appearance on Fox Business, said, the real problem is that schools have stopped teaching values and are now teaching wokeness and indoctrinating <sighs> children with things like CRT. Oh. That's why we have school shootings, because mm-hmm. children are learning about racial justice. Yeah, uh, that, he, that monster who went into the grocery store in Buffalo and killed a bunch of African Americans, he was woke. it was that he was too woke. He is too woke. Yeah. Gun violence is not going to be solved by some gun law. The solution lies in stronger families, more supportive communities. And I would argue, Ron Johnson said, faith. We've lost that. We stopped teaching values in so many of our schools. Now we're teaching wokeness. And I would agree that stronger families, more supportive communities, and renewed faith, religious uh, revival would all help. They would all help. But so would having fewer guns. England it's, is way more secular than the United States, and they have a lot less violent gun crime than we do. And just France because too. Yeah. States France with too. more guns have more gun violence. Okay. Um, I want to, I would just, we have to go back to Australia. We have to talk about Australia just a bit, because I want to know why we can't try what Australia did. On April 28th, 1996, a 28-year-old man with a troubled past walked into a cafe in Port Arthur, a tourist town on the island of Tasmania, and opened fire with a semi-automatic rifle. He killed 35 people and wounded another 28. Australia's prime minister at the time, John Howard, had just taken office six weeks earlier as the head of a center-right coalition. He quickly drew a very clear conclusion from the Port Arthur killing. Australia has too many guns, and they were too easy to get. Howard persuaded both his coalition and Australia's states, uh, because it's a federal system like us, to agree to a sweeping nationwide reform of gun laws. The so-called National Firearms Agreement, the NFA, drafted the month after the shooting. So they got political. Right after a shooting, they got political and they did something. Sharply restricted legal ownership of firearms in Australia. It also established a registry of all guns owned in the country, among other measures, and required a permit for all new firearms purchases. One of the most significant provisions of the NFA was a flat-out ban on certain kinds of guns, such as automatic and semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. But there were quite a few of these such guns in circulation already, so the NFA required getting them off the streets. Australia solved this problem by introducing a mandatory buyback. Australia's states would take away all guns that had just been declared illegal. In exchange, they'd pay the gun owners a fair price set by a national committee using market value as a benchmark to compensate for the loss of property. 
about 650,000 legally owned guns were peacefully seized and then destroyed as part of the buyback. So. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> they only 650,000 guns. Yeah, and that, that represented about 20% of all privately owned guns in Australia. We have an estimated 400 million in the uh -huh. United States. We, we have more. But yeah. you might say, I bet it didn't do any good because if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns, right? Have you ever mm -hmm. heard that, Christian? I have heard that. Yes. So in 2011, a Harvard study reviewed all of the research on Australia's suicide and homicide rate after the NFA went into effect. The conclusion was clear. The NFA seems to have been incredibly successful in terms of lives saved. What they found is a decline in both suicide and homicide rates after the NFA. The average firearm suicide rate in Australia in the seven years after the bill declined by 57% compared with the seven years prior. The average firearm homicide rate went down by about 42%. Australia's homicide rate was already declining before the NFA was implemented, so you can't con attribute all of the drop to the new law. But they did additional studies uh, to figure out which part you could attribute to the new laws. The drop in firearm deaths was largest among the type of firearms most affected by the buyback. Secondly, firearm deaths in states with higher buyback rates per capita fell more proportionately than in states with lower buyback rates. There's also this, 1996 and 1997, the two years in which the NFA was implemented saw the largest percentage decline in the homicide rate in any two-year period in Australia between 1915 and 2004. Just last year, you know the RAND Corporation? They do mm -hmm. lots of research. They research the heck out of everything. The RAND Corporation in 2021 did a meta-analysis of all the available evidence about Australia's gun buyback. They concluded the strongest evidence is consistent with the claim that the NFA caused reductions in three areas, caused significant reductions in firearm suicides, mass shootings, and female homicide victimization. So what it didn't affect as much was just your everyday petty crime using a gun. Mm -hmm. you know, there were still 80% of the guns in circulation, and there were still petty crime and, and typical street crime happening with guns. What, what declined significantly was suicide deaths by gun, which is the number one gun right. death in America. Um, mass shootings, which is something else that was done particularly with the kinds of guns and, and clips and you know, accessories that they made illegal. And female homicide victimization, where a woman is in a domestic dispute, kind of like a suicide, and in a moment of passion, someone grabs an easily accessible gun and, and kills a woman. Right. You, you know, having been a hospital chaplain, at least a student chaplain, and having been a pastor, I have been multiple times in the hospital room of somebody who has tried to take their own life. And most, thank goodness, most first attempts at suicide fail unless it was attempted with a gun. Hmm. So, and the fact that most gun deaths are suicide means, and when you see the epidemic of loneliness and depression and anxiety that's happening in our society right now, the fact that we have 400 million guns floating around means a lot of people are going to contemplate suicide and they will find themselves successful because they have access to a gun. Just that alone from a Christian point of view should give us pause to think what's the most loving thing to do for our families and our neighbors and the people around us who are struggling. And I understand the idea of erasing 400 million guns is impractical, but there are a lot of steps we can take within the bounds of the law to mitigate this problem. And the fact that our political leaders, at least a significant number of them, refuse to do anything is unacceptable. Yeah. So here's, here's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Why can't we do what they did in Australia? Well, the answer is obvious because we have a second amendment and we love our second amendment and we love to interpret our second amendment very, very broadly. Okay. That's so, part of it. I don't think that's all of it, though, Phil. What? Okay, what's the rest? Well, we I love think our, another, another significant... Gun what's culture. That? It's our gun culture based it on is, our... 
Second it is our it. gun culture, but it's also the fact that Australians don't fear and despise their government the same way a significant number of Americans fear and despise their federal government. And yeah. number two, as a culture, Australia still has more social and institutional trust than Americans do. Okay. So okay. when you have a, a society of people who don't trust one another, who don't trust government, who don't trust society, who are under fear and paranoia, it's really hard to convince them to give up their guns. Yeah. Well, and I would add to that our individualistic nature. You know, we as Americans, you know, are so concerned about our individual rights and we that's the majority of things that we prioritize. So you you put all that together and there's your answer, Phil. And okay. Look at the pandemic. Australia shut down the whole country. Yeah. And they cooperated, whereas we had a significant chunk of our country refusing to even wear a mask in order to yeah, protect yeah. one another. But you still it's just, got, you know, Australia, you've still got some cowboy culture in Australia. You sure. still got, the, you know, Australia has a wild west, like America has a wild west. So, and Australia has a conservative Christian population, like America has a conservative, you know, they're white evangelicals that are fighting against abortion and against uh, teaching evolution in Australia, just like yeah, they are in America. But that's like saying a house cat and a cougar are the same thing because they're both felines. Wait a minute. Are you saying <laughs> white evangelicals in Australia are house cats and white evangelicals in America are cougars? No, I'm saying Australia is a house cat and America is a cougar. Uh, I don't they think they have that's similar any features, <laughs> but one is a lot more dangerous than the other. You saying we're more fierce? Yes, I'm saying oh, we are goodness. Australia on you steroids. You call that a knife? This is a knife. <laughs> Come on, crocodile hunter, crocodile Dundee, everything with crocodile in the name of it. Animals are more fierce in Australia. They got every category of animal that can kill you. Come on, tell him he's wrong, Christian. Tell him he's wrong. I can't. I can't. Okay. Okay. Can't so here's be my with question. you. Here's my question. I get it that we have a gun culture. I get it that we have elevated the Second Amendment to, you know, near uh, idolatry. Why are so many Christians more committed to gun culture than to the flourishing of our neighbors? That's my question. Be why are so... I mean... Okay, I'm meeting with a children's pastor in Texas. I'm speaking at a church. The children's pastor picks me up. He says, so you're from Illinois, right? I said, yeah. He says, yeah, you guys really don't like guns. That's what he knew about Illinois. <laughs> That's what he knew about <laughs> Illinois, that it was somehow anti-gun. I'm in Nashville speaking at another church. There early, it's only the worship team. That's it, just the worship team. And somebody's car in the parking lot, you know, bumper sticker, God, guns, and I don't know what are, what it's the other one. God, guns, and something. Gays? Grits? No. <laughs> I don't remember what the third one is, but the point is it was God and guns were the values of that worship team member. How? Here's what I'm wondering. Okay. I mean, there's parts of the country that have always had a gun culture. So if you grew up Christian there, you're just part of the gun culture. Um, but other parts of the country didn't. And still, in many cases, you know, in rural America and other areas, Christians have adopted the same idea about the Second Amendment, that it's you know, abandoning the Second Amendment or even modifying the Second Amendment is right up there with abandoning your faith in Jesus. Right. How I think it, happen? it speaks to the fact that, and we've talked about this ad nauseum on the show over the years. When you look at white Republican conservatism, and then you look at white evangelicalism, they map onto each other almost identically. And it's not because they're taking their values or ideas from the global church or the historic church or from the New Testament, but because they're taking their values from white Republican conservatism. And so when you bundle those things together as a monoculture, this is what you get. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, like, kind of like what you said, if it really is an example of packaged ethics, you know, yep. and I also wonder 
because there was much less sorting in the U.S. 40 years ago. There was much less, you know, I'm a Christian, so I'm a Republican, or I'm an atheist, so I'm a Democrat. Um, there were pro-life Democrats and pro-choice Republicans. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happened is that issues like abortion were used, you know, as wedge issues to say you're either for us or against us. This is the team if you if you're pro-life. That's the team if you're pro-choice. By the way, if you're on our team, here are the other things that you get if right. you're on our team. Uh, you absolutely love the Second Amendment. You absolutely hate the federal government. You don't want any federal government programs. You want, you know, in the words of Grover Norquist, you want to make the federal government so small you could drown it in a bathtub. So we don't <laughs> want help for the poor. We do want guns. We don't want abortion. Um, we do want states' rights. And we've just, we've taken that whole package you know, as in assuming now, and all of this comes from the Bible because the Constitution came from the Bible, and America is a biblical uh, shiny city on a hill. We are so shiny on that hill. So we've taken the package. And if you're going to reject any element, like how much trouble do you get in in some circles? And this is either on the left or the right. If you come out strongly against part of the package, you get in a lot of trouble. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing with that, me on that point. That's the correct answer, both on the left <laughs> and on the right. <laughs> Christian, you were going to say something? I, I have a couple of thoughts. The first one is a question. And I am wondering, have either of you ever talked to someone who is in that camp that gives you any sort of biblical reasoning for their position? For the position on gun rights? Yes, a biblical position on gun well, rights. Well, you had a you debate know? with David French about gun rights. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know. I don't know if it was it a wasn't, debate. It wasn't really a, <laughs> about a biblical. No, Dave, right. but, but David did give, obviously, he's a very intelligent attorney, and he gave a, a coherent constitutional argument for gun rights. And it's hard... <laughs> For me, not having the training he has to go toe to toe with him on that level, um, but that I can that I can wrap my head around. I mean, mm -hmm. we can have an intellectual discussion, you know, a, a good intellectual debate about the Second Amendment on legal on legal grounds. Okay, mm -hmm. not a question at all. What I'm curious about is the biblical grounding, you know, for people that you know really believe that the Bible supports, you know, the Second Amendment. Rights. What is? What are they saying, and why do they? Uh, uh, Jesus said, "Take a sword when you go on your trip." Ta-da! Uh, there's two other things beyond that quippy one. Um, one is they would argue that the Bible either explicitly or implicitly defends the notion of self-defense. Now that that's questionable because Jesus says, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, do not, re Paul says, don't return evil for evil. Um, but self-defense as an inherent way of restraining evil in the world. I, I think there's a case to be made there. Second then is Romans 13, that the government has the power, bears the power of the sword to punish evildoers. And so it's it's not so much a pro gun argument as it is an anti pacifism argument, and even if you buy the self defense argument, and this is what David French's legal argument was, is he he says this, and I'm, I don't want to overstate it because he could speak for himself, but his argument is that the Second Amendment is primarily an amendment that protects the rights of individuals to defend themselves, and you should have the right to bear whatever weaponry you are likely to encounter in an assault. So in our society today, with so many handguns and assault rifles available, you are likely to encounter one of those in a violent assault. So you should be able to arm yourself with a handgun or an assault rifle. Unless but that's kind of a... We, yeah, that's circular. It's circular, and that's what Unless I brought we up. Like, what Australia did and get rid of the assault rifles. And why right. should we get rid of assault rifles, Phil? Because they're not all that different than just a regular rifle. They just look different. Well, yes, 
But that's kind of part of the thing. How many kids, when they want to shoot something up, go get an assault rifle because it makes them feel cool, like they're in the military or a video game. And your old 22 caliber rifle isn't nearly as cool. So let's get rid of the stuff that makes kids feel cool when they're shooting people. Here's the part I don't get. The argument that Second Amendment advocates want to say is it's my constitutional right to bear arms and the government should not infringe on that. Okay, well, this is not a constitutional right, but it is a recognized legal, um, what's that term? The unenumerated right. I have the unenumerated right to travel freely throughout this country, right? The government can't stop me from traveling. That includes the ability to drive a car. It includes the ability to go to different states. And yet, we recognize that a 2,000-pound car is potentially a lethal device. And so the government regulates who is allowed to drive a car. And they're tested regularly to make sure that they are capable of driving a car. Even if you don't overturn the Second Amendment, even if you don't round up 400 million guns, why on earth can an 18-year-old who's just turned 18 walk into a store and buy multiple guns and assault rifles and armor and then turn around and go shoot up an elementary school? Why can't why doesn't the government require that 18 year old to have to go through a course, to have mm-hmm. to take a test, to have to get a mental evaluation? Why don't all gun owners have to get a mental evaluation every 24, 36 months and a doctor verify, yes, this person is safe to own a gun before they're allowed to? Like it's I don't understand why we can't put those kinds of common sense restrictions right, which right. don't impede and on I, your constitutional rights. So, I'm getting very frustrated with people, with with Christians that will put their attachment to a, the broadest possible interpretation of the Second Amendment before the flourishing of their neighbors. Yeah. That's what I'm having a hard time with, Christian. But if you're frightened, if you're scared, if you think the world's out to get you, that's what happens. Because I need to defend myself. I need an arsenal. Well, and I'm really... All I have to bring to the conversation, honestly, this part of the conversation is some my, of my own experience or, and this is, you know, a generalization and this is a very limited experience, but I have grown up in the South. I've been around an enormous amount of military for the majority of my life. You know, I was a card carrying staunch conservative evangelical Republican Christian. I mean, it was all of those things. I went to churches where we said, you know, sang battle hymn of the Republic, you know, I mean the whole nine yards. So, um, and, and in those groups is this, you know, thinking is very, very entrenched, commonplace, prolific. And, you know, it goes something like this, um, you know, Our Second Amendment rights were given to us by our founding fathers. It's how we make sure we can defend ourselves if the government, you know, ever decides to take over. Uh, It's, you know, for our recreation. It's, you know, and they really do see um, those as equal to, you know, their Christian faith. Somehow it's amalgamated, just like we talked many, many times about, you know, faith and politics being one big organic thing. Um, And, you know, when you, when you're in the military and you're trained with weapons and you're trained with the mindset of our government can turn against us and we have to be prepared. And as Sky says, you're afraid. Um, If somebody starts infringing on any of those rights at all, what they will say is that is a slippery slope. Christian, it's the I, first, I, I'm not I'm arguing re- it. I'm just telling no, no, no. you. I know. And I think what you're bringing up is something really important. And that is we have to understand the genesis of the gun culture, particularly in the South. And it comes yeah. from one thing. And it's slavery. You know, the yeah, irony of the argument that the, gov- that, the ar- that the government could turn on us is in 1861, when Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as president of the United States, the South accurately believed that the federal government was going to threaten to take away their lifestyle, was going to threaten to take away slavery. And so what did the South do? They took up arms against the United States government and they got crushed. Do they really think it's going to work a second time? And then the gun culture in the South 
really emerged from the fact that the South had enslaved millions of African Americans for generations, and they were terrified that with the freeing and liberation of yes. those slaves, oh, yeah. they were going to turn around and kill their white masters. And Absolutely. They should have been afraid. But that's the origin of the gun culture in the South, is we need to protect ourselves against the people that we victimized, and we hate the government because they took away our slaves. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that, but truthfully, I've seen that same kind of mentality in Wyoming. I've seen it in Indiana. I've seen mm-hmm. it in it's uh, Virginia. It's spread. I've seen it. It's spread. I've you seen it in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, yeah, look, um, they're, they're selling Confederate flags on the side of the road in Michigan. Of uh, you know, so right, it's, Michigan. It's just it's part of the culture. It became part of our culture. We have to wrap it up. I am not happy. I'm not a happy camper. I'm sick of the news like this, and I'm sick of followers of Jesus saying, well, I guess we can't do anything. Oh, well, if only they had fathers. Let's pass a law requiring children to have healthy, well-adjusted fathers. Can we do that? Is that something we can legislate? No, you can try to encourage it, but it's a lot easier to take high-capacity magazines off of shelves than it is to send out a fleet of well-adjusted fathers to fatherless children. So let's do what we can do to help our neighbors flourish. Okay, I gotta go. Do we have a guest? We have a guest, right? Yes, we have a very actually smart, thoughtful, wonderful guest. Good. That's exactly what we need at this moment, at this juncture. Thanks, Christian, for being here. You're off for a while. You're going to to all over, right? Yep, headed to Normandy for about a month. Have a great time. (laughs) Thanks, all. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. I'm really grateful to have my friend Andy Crouch back on the show with us. Andy and I were colleagues together at Christianity Today for many years, where I grew to really appreciate his brilliant mind and excellent writing, and he's back with another book. This one is called The Life We're Looking For, Reclaiming Relationship in a Technological World. It's not the first time he's written about the impact of technology. He was on the show some years ago to talk about a previous book, The Tech Wise Family, Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Proper Place. And I highly recommend that book for anybody who's trying to parent teenagers and kids in this era of social media and smart devices. But Andy's latest book is a little different. It's not just about practical things families can do around technology, but it's looking much more broadly at our culture as a whole and putting our current fascination with technology in some historical context. And then he draws heavily from the early church's understanding of personhood to give us a way forward. It's a beautifully and brilliantly written book, and I was so happy to read it and have this conversation with him. I think you'll be inspired and challenged, and Andy gives you completely new categories for which to think about your own engagement with technology and how it might be taking away some of your agency and humanity and how you can get that back. Andy currently serves as a partner for theology and culture at an organization called Praxis. It's a creative engine and incubator for entrepreneurs who are trying to start organizations and businesses that are redemptive in the culture, that aren't just seeking to make a profit, but actually make a difference and bring flourishing to the lives of others. I know Praxis pretty well, and I think as you hear my conversation with Andy about current events and history and technology and how he applies all that to current trends, you'll understand why more of the people who are creating institutions today need to listen to voices like Andy's. Here's my conversation with Andy Crouch. Andy, welcome back to the Holy Post. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy you're here. It's been a long time. And uh, some people know we used to be colleagues at Christianity Today. Life and faith and calling has taken us into different directions, but you're still doing incredibly good work and writing great books. And your latest one is called The Life We're Looking For, Reclaiming Relationship in a Technological World. Um. There's all, as we were talking before we recorded, there is so much in this relatively small book. <laughs> deceptively small. Deceptively small. I mean, it just shows, it, it shows your brilliance, honestly, as a writer, that you can communicate such profound things in a relatively limited amount of space, oh um, which is a really difficult thing to do. Let me begin with this. You, early on in the book, compare technology to magic. Yes. And not necessarily in a favorable way. <laughs> Um, ex- explain- Unlike the favorable way Christians normally speak about magic, right? Well, you know, yeah. I- explain how <laughs> yeah, how yeah, the yeah. in earlier eras, yep. indulgence of magic and uh, alchemy and those kinds of things hmm. inform the way we ought to frame and think about modern technologies. 
Yeah. This is a connection that the practitioners of technology make themselves. So you'll often hear quoted Arthur C. Clarke's uh, very, very famous, maybe the most famous thing he ever said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And people say that in the tech world, like it's a good thing. Like, oh yeah, yeah, our device. And of course, Steve Jobs was famous for this, right? You know, our, the, a magical new device, right? Well, I decided maybe we should actually take that seriously and think about the roots of technology in the very ancient dream of wielding effortless power, which I think is kind of close to the heart of what magic has always been about. Um, yeah, and in, in the book, I basically make the case that technology is science plus a dream. So technology, often, obviously, at one level, is just built on what we have learned in the last 200 years, let's say, about the natural world and how it works and how to harness it in ways that our forebears never quite figured out. Um, but when we learned all that, what did we want it to do? That's the, you know, What was the dream that then drove and drives the development of technology? And that's where I think magic, and maybe more specifically alchemy, um, which is this hundreds, hundreds year old quest that that grew up right alongside and intertwined with what we now think of as modern science. So Newton like spent five years on Newton's law of motions and fifty five years on um, a quest for alchemical powers. Um, and many other si people we think of as scientists now were also alchemists. They didn't really distinguish it. And, I, and alchemy was a dream of finding the key to basically turn anything into gold <laughs> and escape the conditions of being a creature that is become purified from the body and ascend into a kind of immortal spiritual life. That if you had the philosopher's stone, which is what they were trying to find or fabricate, you would get there. I actually think that's exactly the dream that's driving our application of science. So the science is real and the science works. My argument in the book is magic is not, well, I don't know if I would say it's not real. It's not, it, it does not work in the way we think. <laughs> it doesn't work. It, you don't get to work it. It works on you if you decide to pursue magic. And that kind of, to me, feels like what it's like to live in a technological world right now. Uh, it definitely works, but is it I who's getting to work it or is it working on me in ways I didn't expect? Yeah, I'm, forgive me, my dog is barking somewhere in the back. I don't know if you guys can hear that. I'm home alone, so no one can control him. Um, <laughs> you use the, the the analogy of the sorcerer's apprentice, and yeah, everyone's yeah, familiar yeah. of that from Fantasia and, and Disney, right, but it has right. it's rooted, as many early Disney stories were, in actual fairy tales, in this case a Germanic one. Explain how that, that wonderful uh, parable essentially applies to our modern – use of technology. Right. right. Yes. It was written down first by uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the very famous poet who most famous for this sprawling epic poem called Dr. Faustus, which, so, you know, he's someone who was thinking about alchemy at the dawn of modernity. He's writing in 1797 when he writes down the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So, you know, the story is uh, the Mickey Mouse in the, in the Disney version, um, you know, gets the sorcerer's hat, uses it to charm the broom, the broom starts to go to work on its own. This is a very important feature of technology. It operates by itself. That's what we find so magical. We're like, oh, the Roomba, it's just moving by itself. It's vacuuming all by itself. Like, let me put this on YouTube, you know? Um, and uh, the broom the broom is the Mickey Mouse's Roomba. It starts, uh, in this case, not sweeping, but carrying water. But, but then it go, gets out of control, right? And he can't keep it under control. And there's this great line in, in the German poem that actually every German speaker learns this poem in elementary school. And Germans still use this phrase, the spirits I summoned, I cannot now banish. So the idea is like, I, I was able to get the thing going, but now it's taken on a life of its own. And he's only rescued because the sorcerer comes back and knows the counter spell, you could say. Well, I think this is an amazingly, like Goethe is writing in 1797, and yet isn't this kind of what it feels like? Both the intoxicating promise of technology, oh, it's going to work on its own, it's going to uh, take care of all the drudgery that, that we don't want to do. But in fact, what's going to end up happening is it's going to kind of take over and start operating back on us in ways that we can't control and can't stop. And then somebody said something really interesting to me a couple of weeks ago. I was sharing this story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice and he raised his hand. And he said, well, 
I kind of feel like the broom at this point. Like I don't feel like the sorcerer or the apprentice because <laughs> we're actually in this world that seems to like turn us into mechanism and force us to act by the logic of the machine rather than staying at our service. And that to me is, it's just amazing to me that Von Goethe saw all this coming, you know, at the very, very beginning of the turn to the modern. And, and that's really a dominant theme in the first half of your book is that we pursue these technologies because they, they promise us uh, effortless power, I think is yes. that your phrase. Yep. And we think it'll make our lives better. We think it'll make us more human, but it's the inverse. You have this wonderful um, etymology of the word robot. Is it Czech, I yeah. think, is the origin? Czech where or Slavic word. Yep, Slavic, yep. that means yep. serf or slave. Yeah. And we think the, we're going to create these machines to be our slaves and do the work we would rather not do. But the inverse happens and we end up becoming the slaves of the machines. Yeah. You talk at one point about social media as being a superpower. Yeah. But give us an explanation. Why do we not actually want a superpower? Because superpower <laughs> sounds like a great, a great attractive feature. <laughs> but what's the downside of it? Yeah. Well, the, I think the downside of all superpowers, um, and I, and this is a, another common way that people in, in tech talk about tech, like this is going to give you, you know, social, social media gives you social superpowers in the sense of like being able to influence way more people than you normally could, being able to know much more about your influence through follower counts and likes and, you know, kind of being able to assess your influence in ways that who could do that? Like when I was in middle school, I had no idea how many people liked me or, you know, thought something I said was funny. Like you could guess, but you couldn't tell. Well, now you can measure it. Right. So this is a, you could genuinely call it a kind of superpower, but all superpowers I've come to believe require you to trade away certain features that are essential to being fully human. So I think of being human in line with the greatest commandment as being a heart, soul, mind, strength, complex designed for love. I think that's one way to sum up. Like Jesus was asked, was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Well, love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what are we, what are we at our best? We are heart, soul, mind, strength, complex is designed for love. And when you start looking at any technological superpower, it often amplifies or extends one of those qualities but at the expense of the other. So the way social media does it, it, like all media, is it takes away the embodied aspect of relationship. Um, media just literally means something in the middle. It's the Latin word for middle. And when we mediate anything, we, we interpose some layer of essentially technology, whether it's writing or video or, or a Twitter feed or whatever, between us and another person. And we're doing this right now with microphones and we have cameras, we can see each other a little bit, but it's not like having a face-to-face -face conversation. Right. Um, and in fact, I would venture to say that the conversation you and I can have now is, is very different and better because we actually had quite a bit of time face-to-face -face unmediated earlier in our life and work. And when you have a purely mediated relationship, and a lot of what happens on social media, you've literally never met these people that you allegedly ha follow and influence and like and so forth. You've taken away that whole embodied layer. And the superpower offering says, oh, doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Think of how much more power you'll have. And you're like, okay, sure. I don't think I really needed to be embodied after all. Um, I would say that always ends up turning out to be a very bad bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and bad for us, bad for the system that we're in, and often ends up um, even as bad as it is for the, it's bad for the winners. It's even worse for the people kind of on the other end who end up, in, that we end up exploiting other people when we take away these layers of our proper powers and trade them for superpowers. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, early in the book, you quote, is it Leanne Payne who says we either contemplate uh, or we exploit? We either contemplate or we exploit. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into that later. But it's one of the most ask, powerful sentences I've ever heard. It is. Heard. Uh, it just it jumped out to me. It's, it's kind of scary. Okay. Let me ask you something that's not really in the book, mm -hmm. but was in the background as I was reading it and thinking about it. You and I both come from an evangelical Christian tradition here in the United States that has as one of its dominant features throughout history is the utilization of technology, particularly particularly media, in order mm. to advance 
its understanding of the mission of the gospel. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Whether we're talking about written media, the printing press going back to the Reformation, radio, yeah. television. Yeah. Yeah. You and I worked yeah. for a magazine. We created right. websites, right? So what do you make then today of some segments of the church who are eager to adopt all the different technologies and media that are now available to us in the belief that they can use it for the good of the gospel or for the good of the world, for that matter. Is that a Faustian bargain of, of a sort? Like, are, are we the sorcerer's apprentice who are meddling with things that we won't ultimately be able to control and may end up destroying us? <laughs> oh, no, 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 surely not. Not at all. <laughs> I actually think this is a hugely consequential question. Um, and basically, I would say, uh, if you are not, well, uh, let's see, let me put it, let me say two things. One is, <laughs> actually, I came through the world you just described, but I didn't come from it. So my own entry into faith came through the charismatic renewal in the mainline churches, which was really actually very separate from that mediated world of evangelicalism. I didn't know that thing, that that world, uh, that, that uh, evangelical world existed until I really got to college and met people who had grown up in it. Um, and I will say the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement that is behind it was a different thing. Um, it was extremely embodied. It was highly affective. It depended on shared, collective, present, uh, bodily present experiences of the power of the spirit. Now, it has its own complicated <laughs> legacy and story. And it's also, it, it took advantage of certain kinds of media, for sure. You think of people like Jimmy Swaggart or, or whatever. Sure. Um, but, but, I would just footnote that that actually, um, when I came to evangelicalism, I was struck by this feature of it, that it was very reliant on media tricks to create um, uh, emotional experiences as well as intellectual ones that, that in my uh, coming to faith had always happened like very much in person, very informally with uh, not slick at all, uh, not always quite as real as I think we wanted it to be, but but anyway, so uh, I just want, I don't know, uh, I know that I've spent a lot of time in evangelical institutions, but I've never felt totally of it because it's not where I started. And it always, I'm always like, oh yeah, this is how this world works. How interesting, how strange. Um, the second thing I'd say uh, more substantively is I think all uses of media <laughs> are an attempt to be like God because the one human being who was fully God and fully human did not use media ever. So he never wrote anything down. No one ever made an image of him. There were images of a certain God man all around Jesus. His name was Augustus. Uh, he was Caesar. He created images of himself and sent them to every corner of the empire on coins to sort of clarify who was God and man. Uh, Jesus didn't do that. Um, and then people, of course, immediately say, oh, but his followers wrote things down, right? <laughs> they wrote letters and so forth. They used media. And that's true. And it's partly because it, the, the closer you are to being <laughs> fully at, at, at one with the Father and fully empowered by the Spirit, the less media you need to make the difference you need to make in the world. And the further we get from that incarnate, Spirit-filled life, the more we rely on media to simulate that. But the other thing I'll say is the first Christians never did it without sending a person. They never used media without a person. So they write their letters, but they do not entrust them to the informal postal network that most people use. They would send it on a ship that was going in roughly the right direction. They, you, and often we know who the person is. Phoebe carries the letter of the Romans uh, from Corinth to Rome. She's named in the letter. Uh, who is it? Epaphroditus or whatever his name is, is the carrier of the letters between Paul and the Philippians, right? So, and, and then when Paul collects money, which is another form of media for the church in Jerusalem, he wants to take it himself. So the first Christians, I think, had this sort of instinct. If we let this thing get mediated away from relationship, it won't be as good. And and that gets to what I think we need to be doing now, which is re-anchoring our use of media, including very sophisticated ones, in embodied relationship and, and in personal presence, rather than thinking that the goal is to get free of the requirement of personal presence so we can have an impact on the world. I'm glad you put Sorry, it that, that way. That was a very long answer. 
it, it was, but well thought through. I, well, and here's why. I think if someone picks up your book and reads the first half of it, they might, th- if, and, and if they knew nothing about you, they might think, oh, he's advocating for some kind of return to an agricultural pre-technological yeah. Amish existence. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because of all of these great evils and, and the dehumanization that happens through technology. But that's not what you're no. arguing for. Right. Uh, right. Relatively early in the second half of the book, you have this uh, quote from Steve Jobs where he compares mm. computers to bicycles. Mm-hmm. And you make the point, well, he could have compared a computer to a car or an airplane or a rocket mm. ship or something that right. that transports you at a massive speed rather than a bike, which transports you faster than walking or running, but not – right. Right. So, and from that, you draw not out the superpower print. speed. The right. bike is not a superpower. The motorcycle so draw, is a superpower. Yeah. You draw out this very nuanced understanding of technology that doesn't destroy our core humanity, but is utilized by it. So, explain that a little bit more why the bicycle thing <sighs> works for you, whereas the others don't. Yeah, because the bicycle. And this, you know, this phrase, it's so beautiful. And I think Steve Jobs was very sincere when he used it. The computer is a bicycle for the mind. It's just, it's a gloriously inviting phrase. It sounds like something you would really want. And my only question is, why didn't we get it? Why did we instead get like a self-driving car for the mind where I just, it takes me places. I'm not sure how it's working. I can't see under the hood. I'm not operating it. I'm not growing as I use it. Uh, to a great extent, it becomes a kind of consumer consumption device rather than what he's describing as this great kind of ultimate creative device. And what I think happened is about a hundred years ago, when we started to hook up how the world really worked, we got access to power and cybernetics. Basically we were able to self power things rather than using human power or animal power. And then we were able to develop internal control systems that kept them from just going totally off the rails. This is what the kind of first breakthrough in this is the steam engine. And then we get just uh, endless iterations on that, that, that we, we let it go off track from what had been the technological story for all of human history, which is the story of tools and tools are um, human extensions of human capabilities that keep human beings fully engaged with the world. They don't run off and operate by themselves but we, driven by this dream of magic, we're like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if the broom just swept on its own? And it is amazing in a certain way, but it also comes with these huge trade-offs for human capability, human relationship. And what I'm urging us to change course towards is not, I'm not asking us to roll back to some previous moment in the history of tool making. I'm actually asking us to rejoin that story and make what in the book I call instruments, which can be very high tech, but they're fully used for, they are only used for and by heart, soul, mind, strength complexes designed for love. So can, yeah, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. Can you give an example of a way you think a modern technology is being used instrumentally rather than yeah, truly in, as in a dehumanizing way? Well, I actually think one of the best examples, only because it's so gloriously useless to mammon, and yet it costs so much money, and yet we keep doing it, is astronomy. <laughs> so, so okay, you know, like if you study certain kinds of engineering, everyone understands why you do that because that makes useful things. But what good is to is it to us that we can image a black hole? Like, uh, I mean, what difference has that made? How many lives does that save? I mean, basically. You know, we like as we're having this conversation just last week, I think we got the first image assembled of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy. We've done that with one other black hole before, but it was not our black hole, right? So we've now seen our black hole. And and it takes navel gazing to a whole new level when, <laughs> right? When it's your own galaxy's black hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, so think about the incredible layers of, you know, what we call technology, like high tech that's required to do that. But none of it is magic. It, it requires incredibly hard work, incredible human investment of skill and energy and attention. And, and it also generates this deeply human response of, of beauty. There's actually a kind of visual beauty to the thing, uh, even as simple and rudimentary as, as our images are right now. 
but also mathematical beauty, kind of intellectual beauty, like this world holds together in such an astonishing way. And we've actually managed to figure it out as human beings. But at no point do human beings just lie back and let the telescope do its thing. <laughs> now, now there's all kinds of uh, autonomous power and control system cybernetics that have to be harnessed, but they're always kept within the orbit, as it were, of human beings, like on a quest for understanding and beauty and delight and wonder. And if they are Christian, and some of these scientists are, praise, right? So it's super high tech. What, what I love about it, as I say, is it's so gloriously unuseful in economic terms. Uh, you know, it's not like mining an asteroid for rare earth metals or something, which I don't necessarily object to us doing that. But it's just so beautiful that human beings want to do things that have no, they don't cash out in anything but wonder. <laughs> That's instruments. They're using instruments. It's amazing. So one of the things you do throughout this book, which I find incredibly satisfying as a reader and as a writer, is you draw from early history. We already talked about magic and alchemy to explain technology, but you do that again and again and again through the book. But the major turn is halfway through, you go back to the early church, particularly the church in Corinth, mm -hmm. and use that as an example of a community that is fully embodied, that's fully present, that's fully human and recognizes each other as persons. Most of us would not think to go back to the first century church as an antidote to our technological age. Right, right, right. right. We go back to it for other things. We, oh, the, yeah. the family is fracturing. What did they think about right. family in the early? <laughs> the, the church's mission is floundering. Well, how did they do it in the early church? But we don't usually think about, let's go to the New Testament for guidance on modern technology. Right. What did the early church and particularly the Corinthian church display that we need to recapture, not just in the church today, but in society today? Mm. Well, I was, I think I was first like lured in this direction by an observation from the writer, uh, Alan Jacobs, who pointed out at some point or, or made the kind of observation that we actually have never stopped living in the Roman Empire in one hmm. way. So we think of the Roman Empire as having fallen, you know, maybe the fall of Rome or something like that. But his sort of observation and argument was the dreams that animated Rome have continued to be the dreams of the West. So that was the first, that was the first like little thing. I was like, Oh, maybe we're actually still living in that world more than we think. So maybe that world is more relevant to our world than we think. Like we're living in the Roman world in a way that we're not living in the Assyrian world or the Babylonian world. Those empires are truly lost to us, but the dreams of Rome are not lost to us. So maybe there's something we can learn from people who lived at the height of that, at the triumph, at the, the apex of that. The second thing that got me thinking about it was I was thinking about the three revolutions that I would say make for our modern technological world. And in, in sequence, they're the financial revolution, basically the invention of money as an independent unit of account, double entry accounting in the Medici's bank in the 15th century. Then the industrial revolution is the second one, which is the steam engine and the harnessing of power. And then the computational revolution, which is a kind of explosion or information revolution, you could say. Well, it, it then occurred to me somehow oh my goodness, Rome actually had versions of all three. So Rome is the first empire to really mobilize currency as a major way of vectoring wealth around the empire, especially to support the standing armies of the empire. Other, uh, other empires didn't mobilize money in the way Rome did. Um, Rome had an engineering, a whole bunch of engineering breakthroughs. Now they didn't have our our steam engines or whatever, but th they did some really amazing things. They were right. far more technologically advanced in that sense than roads and empires. aqueducts roads, and all kinds aqueducts, of things. Those, yeah. Yeah, heated water. I mean, amazing things. Right. Um, and then they had an information explosion because they conquered the Arab and the Greek worlds and absorbed all that knowledge, which for that time was an incredible breakthrough in information. And so I was like, Oh, they, anticipated in certain ways, the very things and, and the first and Christianity comes into being as, as these three revolutions are like taking off under the, the long reign of Augustus Caesar and his successors. So then you just get to the fact that the first Christians live in an empire, which I just think is exactly the case for us. The only difference is their emperor had an actual name and a face and put his name on coins. Our emperor is the coin. <laughs> right? it, who cares whose face is on it? You can have George Washington or Abraham Lincoln right. or Alexander Hamilton or Xi Jinping or 
uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth, it doesn't matter. It's the coin. That, and so I would say we now live not in an empire ruled by a man, but an empire ruled by mammon, which I would say is a principal principality that has always existed in history, but has now built a whole social apparatus that drives our world. So if they figured out how to live in a countercultural humane way in their empire, which was extremely exploitative, and it had a lot of robots, by the way, in the sense of it was like 20 to 30% slaves in the Roman Empire, human beings who were treated as property, as things. Maybe we need to like pattern our lives after their lives in our world of exploitation and robots, including people who are treated like robots. To do that, though, you have to believe what you already articulated that we are we live in an empire and this empire is exploitive and analogous yeah. to Rome but secondly then you have to believe that the christian message and the christian community exists to undermine that system in yes. some way to be a counter system to it there's so many christians today however especially in the united states especially in evangelicalism especially in white evangelicalism who see themselves as the primary champions of that the, system, the stewards of that system, exactly, yes. and and oh and gosh. actually demonize those who are trying Ugh. to undermine. Um, I know. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation for another day, I suppose. Uh, what is some practice that you you saw in the early church as you looked at it again, maybe Corinth in particular, that is accessible to us now that you think a Christian community needs to be giving more intentionality and focus toward if we are to be that counterculture. Hmm. I know there's many, but highlight yeah. one. Well, the one that in some ways was the proximate inspiration for this book, or to put it another way, when I, I mean, I knew I wanted to write a book about technology, but it was actually when I, when this story crystallized for me, I, I was like, oh, now I can write the book. Is is actually the the greeting from the scribe named Tertius that I write about. So in Romans mm -hmm. 16, Paul has this long list of people he wants to say hello to. Who knows how he knows all these people? He's never been to Rome, but he has all these people he wants to greet. And then comes this line, I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. And this is the scribe, almost certainly a slave, perhaps a freed slave, but certainly from the slave class. Um, and this almost never happens in Greco-Roman letters, but the, the, the typewriter... <laughs> speaks up, you know, the human being whose job is just to write down what he heard in dictation. It's like, I greet you. And, not, and I don't just say hello. I greet you in the Lord, like as a fellow brother. And his name is so interesting because his name is just the Latin word for number three. Yeah. He's a person who in <laughs> the moment when he was born, they're like, oh, here's number three. <laughs> like it's. <laughs> and it's stuck. <laughs> and that's it. Like that's his name. Right. And this is very common in Rome because unless you're the firstborn son who the firstborn son gets often takes the father's name and gets a prenomen of his own and all that. Uh, the, it just doesn't matter. Like it's just another mouth to feed like uh, number three, right? Especially if it's a, a child born to be enslaved. And that dignity that is granted Tertius in that moment that that Paul's like, oh no, you also should greet them. And then we learn the brother Quartus is there. Tertius says, I'm in the home of a guy named Gaius Erastus, who's the city treasurer. So here's this high status people. And then the brother Quartus, which means number four. <laughs> so I'm like, is that Tertius <laughs> younger brother? Like, right. Um, so what I take from this guy to get to your question is the first Christians included in their community as full members of the community, people who everyone else on the street like would have said, that's not even that is not even a persona in Latin. That's a that's race. That's stuff. Because any slave was treated in the law as property, as stuff, and and they would have been like, that's not even really a person. Certainly not a person of any account, except to their their maybe their mother. But I don't know if your mother named you number three. I don't know <laughs> how much how much did you feel like she loved you. I don't know. Um, and the church said they are all brothers and sisters. Yeah. To me, in the second to last chapter in the book, I call this the community of the unuseful, the people who were not seen as a path to power, a path to privilege or status. They couldn't adopt you and make you, you know, bring you into their line of patronage and uh, all these things that made the Roman world run. And they were just as valued as brothers and sisters as anyone else. And I would translate that in our world, not just to the people who do the um, menial labor, the people who often aren't acknowledged or 
in our world right now, the people who still have to wear masks while everyone else gets to not wear a mask, you know, like the service people, the wait staff, mm-hmm. it does include those people. But I also think about all the people who will never um, contribute anything to Mammon's economy, the least abled, the disabled, the oldest, the youngest, um, people like my niece who had trisomy 13. My niece never could talk or speak uh, or really see or hear. But for 12 years, she was part of our family and she was part of a church family. And she died young because people don't live long with that condition. But while she was alive, like a whole community gathered around her and said, this is a person. And this person has something to teach us about being persons. That to me is the fundamental practice, even more than what we do with our technology, that's going to determine whether we offer a real countercultural witness or we actually are just handmaids to mammon. I'm I'm glad you mention that value and principle. It, it, I've been writing a series in my daily devotional about the miracles of Jesus. And just this morning, I was mm. writing the story about him healing Bartimaeus in huh. Mark Mark chapter 10. Yeah. And there's this little, what might be a throwaway moment. Bartimaeus, of course, is yelling at the side of the road, you know, Jesus, yeah. have mercy on me. And finally, mm. Jesus calls him forward. And it's obvious what Bartimaeus wants. I mean, it's clear he's mm. blind. He's a beggar in Jericho. He wants mm. to be healed. He says, have mercy on me. But Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Want, yes. Isn't that incredible? And the very act of asking oh, this gosh. man a question dignifies him. Wow. It, it invites Bartimaeus to participate in his own healing wow. by, by simply asking, articulating, yeah. speaking what it is you want. And so he says, I yeah. want to be able to see. And yeah. that theme you find throughout the Bible where God invites us to participate with him, obviously yeah. he doesn't need us. Jesus could have healed his blindness with a touch or a word without asking yep. him, but yep. he, he does that to bestow dignity and personhood and agency. Exactly. It, it was Pascal, Pascal who said that, that God has given us prayer so that he might give us the dignity of being causes. Wow. That we get to participate with him in the things of the world. So to take that value into every person who's a part of our community, uh, your niece, a child, an elderly person, somebody who has no wealth or or power to contribute to the church. And at this moment, especially when so much of the American church seems to be freaking out that it's losing power (sighs) in the culture to recognize that maybe it's in the loss of it that we discover what really matters. So your book does that beautifully. And one last thing before we wrap up here, and I, don't, I hadn't thought about this in advance to articulate it well, but your book is really weird in, <laughs> in the sense that, and I mean, this is a compliment, like it's not a typical Christian book Indeed, in that I would have no problem handing this book to a friend or relative who's not a believer as a resource to them about, here's a great articulation of the challenges we're facing with technology that draws from an ancient source to give us a vision for how to overcome it. And they would figure out, obviously there's a lot of Christianity, especially in the latter half of the book, but you write in such an inviting way to a culture that may not have that point of view. And that those, that kind of resource is so rare. So I obviously recommend this to a Christian. They're going to resonate with a lot of what's in this book, but this is a book for anyone who's looking for answers in this moment. And and points them in the direction of the wisdom of the church and the gospel and Jesus himself as relevant for this moment, which I, the, your ability to do mm. that is, is a gift and a wonderful resource. So thank you for that. Wow. Thank you for noticing that. That was probably one of the deepest quests I was on in writing this was to do, I mean, you've just, <laughs> you may not have prepared, but you said it very articulately. You've named exactly what I was hoping I, I would do. I mean, by the end of the book, no one's going to be mistaken about what I believe is ultimately true. And right. it's, a, it's a pretty Christian book by the very end. But but up to the last moment, I want any reader to be like, oh, this doesn't assume I'm what I believe. I can tell what mm-hmm. the author believes, but it doesn't assume I believe it. But But it invites me into seeing the world the way this movement has seen the world. And maybe that's more relevant than we thought and more important than we thought. Yeah, it's exactly what I hoped would happen. So well, that's so I'm, encouraging you saw that. I'm drawn toward and trying to figure out how to write more like that and communicate more like that. And I feel, I mean, throughout my career, I feel like you've always been a number of steps ahead of me, Andy, and you are in this case as well and and teaching me through this. So thank you for that. Oh, and, I, and I hope that someday I can produce things that 
sort of a, a similar bridge between the wisdom of our faith and the need of the world. But you've done it brilliantly, and I recommend everyone pick it up. Andy, thank you so much for coming back and talking to us. Thank you, Sky. Really a gift. All right. Until next time. Thank you. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash Holy Post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more. 